We had the Gideons with us this morning. I don't know if you know this. I used to be a Gideon, and they kicked me out. <laughs> when, you, when you become a pastor, you can't continue to be a Gideon. But I entirely believe in what they're doing because I have had testimony, and I need to share some with them, of individuals whose lives were changed and saved, spiritually, even physically, because they had a Gideon Bible. Uh, had one guy, he would he landed at, on D-Day at Normandy Beach, and the Gideons used to have these little Bibles that had a steel cover with hinges on it. I don't know if you guys have ever seen one. He had one in his field jacket, and uh, an eight millimeter round from a, a German up on the cliff uh, fired around, and that bullet embedded itself in his Gideon Bible, and that steel covered New Testament and Psalms and Proverbs physically saved his life. And when he died, he never told anybody about this and showed it to him. And I made a huge mistake. When he did that, I should have documented the story and gotten pictures of that Bible. Uh, it's somewhere here in heaven. And, uh, and, and showed that to people because it was quite a testimony. He did become a believer. And I, was, I did a Christian funeral when he went home to meet the Lord. But I just thought it would be interesting. We need to find that, that person. I'll have to look back in my files. Open your Bibles, if you would, to the Gospel of John. We're in a series of messages from all four Gospels, and I'm calling this The Life and Times of Jesus Christ. Now, today's sermon is from the Gospel of John because we used some other texts from some of the other Gospels last week, and I am very excited about preaching this series, and I'm glad that we're taking this journey together. I pray that we will all grow stronger because we'll be feeding on the Word of God. So it was interesting, we had the, an introduction from the Gideons on the Word of God and distribution of it. Now I want to talk about feeding on it, because if you just have one and don't read it, it won't do you any good, unless it happens to catch a bullet. But, if, but uh, most of us will never experience any kind of a situation like that. So I suggest to you that we all commit ourselves to reading the Word. You know, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, so we have to read it. So if you found uh, the book of John, uh, chapter 1, that's where I'm beginning, the beginning, <laughs> if you would stand with me for reading God's Word, and we're going to read just a few verses out of the beginning of the Gospel of John. Father, speak to us now. We pray that we might hear your voice as we read your Word. We pray we realize that it is Spirit-filled, it is alive, it is the very Word of God. So help us to hear and understand what we read. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. That word there means it could not overcome it. It could not put it out. There was a man set from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You may be seated. I told you, I'm very excited about preaching this series, and I'm glad we're doing this together. This Gospel was written by, obviously, the beloved disciple, John. As Jesus was dying for our sin upon the cross, John came with Mary, the birth mother of Jesus Christ, 
standing at the feet of Jesus as he was dying upon the cross. And Jesus spoke to John, and he told this John, who wrote this gospel, to take care of his mother, Mary. In fact, he said that he would be the son of Mary, and that Mary would be the, the mother of John. And they, they were to care, he was to care for her. Folks, this was a very, very tender moment for Jesus Christ. And he ensured that his mother would be cared for by this beloved disciple that we know as John. When you read Matthew, you read through the eyes of a devout disciple. When you read Mark and Luke, you read the eyes of dedicated believers who knew and loved the Lord. And all of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, were all chosen by the Lord Jesus Christ to be his followers. So they were hand-picked. All of the Gospels are inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. All of the Gospel accounts include information from their first-hand eyewitness accounts, plus the eyewitness testimony of others. But we must always remember all of the Word of God is inspired by God's Holy Spirit. It has authority. It is alive. It's powerful. It'll never die. Many other things in the world will pass away. The Word of God will never, no, not ever, pass away. So what we have is a treasure. It is a sincere, wonderful treasure, a living account. And it's a love letter to you and me. It contains words of life, not of death, not of darkness. It contains words that give life to men and women, boys and girls. That's why the Gideons distribute those things, those little Bibles. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and the letters of Paul and Peter had already been written and circulated when this Gospel of John was written, and when it then was circulated to the Christians among the churches. When you read John, you read the words of the disciple who, at the Last Supper, leaned against the very chest of Jesus Christ before he was crucified. He was in the inner circle, along with James and Peter, among the disciples. He was very, very close to Jesus. Jesus knew that John loved him, and Jesus loved John. But I want to tell you something. He loves you as much as he loved John. I want you to understand and appropriate that to yourself. Some of us are struggling in life with our own worth as a person. And we look and we see all the faults that we have committed. And we see all the things that we should have done that we didn't do. And those are true. But the fact is, God loves you no matter what. He loves you and He wants you to know Him and to repent from your sin and to come to Him and follow Him. Don't ever forget that, how much Jesus loves you. John heard more and he witnessed more than any other disciple. He was one of the Lord's closest, very closest friends. And when we read John's Gospel, we can anticipate what this John, disciple whom Jesus loved is going to say to us. This is one of the last books in the New Testament to be written. It's the only book in the Bible that states its purpose, to tell people how to find eternal life. John doesn't retrace all the events already described in the other Gospels. He doesn't write a chronological biography of the life of Jesus like Luke did. His purpose isn't to detail the ministry of Jesus. John's Gospel has a distinct purpose and he writes about it in 20, the ch 20th chapter, verse 30 and 31. He says, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So he actually specifies the purpose of the writing of this beautiful book that we know as the Gospel according to John. He doesn't mention the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, so I'm not sure whether this was written before 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. Or many scholars believe that it was written later in the first century, maybe around 85 to 95 uh, uh, AD. I don't know because it doesn't have a date in it. It doesn't specify a date. I can tell you that I think it was written certainly by John, the beloved disciple, 
and it was written during the first century. And he wrote this gospel so you might believe Jesus is the Christ and so that you might have eternal life, not just temporary life. These first verses that we read contain a summary of John's conviction about Jesus Christ and it is one of the most important passages in all of the Bible about the identity of Jesus Christ. If you want to know who Jesus is, read the Gospel of John and especially read and meditate on these first 15 to 18 verses in the first chapter of John. You all understand Christianity is not a philosophy and it's not just a religion. Christianity is about how to have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ himself. It's real. It's not something made up by somebody. It is about someone and his name is Jesus Christ. Other world religions focus on the teachings of their founders. Christianity is about a personal relationship with a real person. His name is Jesus. He is the most astonishing person in the history of mankind. He is God who left the glory of heaven, cast off the visible appearance of his own glory, humbled himself to be born in a stable. He came to give his life. He came to die to take sin upon himself, one who has never done any sin, no one who never will do any sin, took our sin on himself, and he died in our place. That's astonishing. There is no other religion where the... The, the God of any other religion would actually sacrifice his own life to save our life. Jesus Christ did. You can count on it. If you know him, you understand what I just said. If you don't know him, then you need to get to know him because to know him is to know life. Other people in history come and go. They fade away. But Jesus Christ is just as important today as he was 2,000 years ago. In fact, from the beginning of eternity. <laughs> and we're going to attempt to learn who he is. So, first thing. We need to believe on Jesus because he's God. The scripture itself says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Now, some of you are thinking, I've heard those words in the beginning before, and we're going to get there in just a moment. John tells us who Jesus is. He tells us why we should believe in him. Why? Because he is God. That's a good reason to believe in him. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. He was born in the flesh. But don't ever forget, he is entirely, he is absolutely, he is perfectly, he is for sure God himself. That's who Jesus Christ is. So believe on him because of who he is. And because he provides life to every man, woman, boy, and girl who believes on him. John didn't begin his story as Mark did with the story of John the Baptist. John didn't begin his gospel as Luke did with this, the births of uh, John and the birth of Jesus Christ. He didn't go back with Matthew to the genealogy of Abraham and the roots of Israel or Luke to the beginning of the human race and Adam. John starts in the beginning, before human history. John opens his gospel within eternity with God. Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You cannot go back any further than God in eternity past. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning, from all eternity, the Word has eternally existed. So when you're talking about Jesus Christ, you're talking about the One who has always existed. Before the laying of the foundation of the earth, before anything was created, Jesus Christ existed in the person of the Son of God because He is God and He's today seated at the right hand of God the Father. The original word that translates into the word in English is the Greek word logos. Logos is a Greek word. It comes from the word lego. I say now all the kids of you are saying lego. I know what legos are. Those are those little blocks that you put together. And they were uh, created a long time ago. A guy was out of work and he needed something to do so he 
created a little company to make toys and he made those and you know people are still buying little blocks to put them together. More than a hundred years later people are still putting Legos together. The guy was a, in Denmark, I think he was an old Kirk Christian and he used this term Lego. In Danish it means play well. In Latin it means I say. <laughs> comes from the word I say. Has kind of a, depends which language you want to use. By the way, when you go into Legoland, what's the first, where do you begin? In the beginning, right? Isn't that the first part? And I think, isn't there a section in Legoland that's called the Revenge of Pharaoh? It has nothing to do with the Bible, I'm sure. That the beginning in the beginning and the, and the revenge of the Pharaoh, it had nothing to do with the Bible, right? You know it does too. <laughs> it's a neat place to go. It's a place to have fun with children. But today I want to talk about something that gives much more than fun. It gives eternal life. And his name is Jesus Christ. The, the, the word Lego means I say. Now when Moses said, who shall I say sent me? He said, say that I am sent you. It's the first person masculine singular of the, of the verb to be. I am. That's what the word is. It means I am. When you say Lego, it means I say. When he said Logos, it's a Greek form of this word, and it means basically the word, the spoken word, but it's more than just the spoken word, it's the word that God speaks. And when God speaks, as you said, Art, it never returns void. When God spoke, everything that exists, bang, came into, came into creation. He spoke. So when we say he's the Logos, he's the spoken word through whom everything that exists spontaneously, bang, came into creation. So they're kind of right about it. They just don't understand that the one who, bang, created everything is the God himself when he spoke. And it is true. They've mathematically calculated everything began at one moment. They just haven't quite attributed this to the one who created the moment, which is God. Logos, the spoken word, the word of God. I could say much more about it, but we're going to keep moving. The word is eternally God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. So John is informing us that the word existed from all eternity. At the beginning of time, the word was with God. He already was when time began. At creation, the word was already present. The word was with God. In the Greek, the word is pros, P-R-O-S, means face to face. In the Hebrew they would say panim al panim, face to face. What they meant is when you're before God, when you come before Him, you don't just come before Him, you come face to face. Now I see in the mirror darkly, but then face to face. Then I'm going to be confronted with the very presence of God. So when you come into the presence of God, He's a real person. He has a face. You have a face. He created us. He created us in His image. I don't look physically like God, but I have been created by God in His image to reflect Him. An image is a reflection, right? So my life is supposed to reflect God. So when I say that He was in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, it tells me that we were created to be in the presence of God, to know Him. You might say, well, you're making this up. No, the life was manifested, 1 John 1, 2 says, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that, etern that eternal life. That eternal life is Jesus. It's not about that life, it's that eternal life is Jesus, which was with the Father and was manifested or revealed to us. So John gives us a picture of one God who exists in three persons. The Word has existed from eternity past. He is a separate person from God, but He is so infinitely, perfectly one with God, they are essentially Father, Son, and Holy Spirit one with God. You and I just have a little problem trying to comprehend what it's like to have an infinitely perfect relationship with anybody. Right? 
Don't we have a little struggle there? <laughs> Come on, are you awake? We have a struggle in this area of understanding what it's like to be one. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, hard for us to grasp or comprehend, are one. And John gives us a picture of one God in three persons. And second thing, not only is, is he uh, eternally God, but he is uh, absolutely equally God. Now these five words, the word is equally God, are so important to help us understand who he is. And the word was God. He's not a God, he is God himself. As much as the Father is God, the word is God. He was with God, he is God, he's equal with God, the word is God. Third, the Word is essentially God, in His essence, who He is. The Word of God is in His very essence, His very nature, He is God. He is separate from the Father in His personhood. He is one with God in His very essence, who He is, is God. The Word possesses God's qualities. The Word participates in the reality we call God. The Word is God. What we have here is the mystery of the Trinity. I remember John MacArthur uh, speaking about this many, many years ago, maybe 30 years ago, and he was saying, if you want to go crazy, try to comprehend and understand with our limited mind and un un intelligence, try to understand how three can be one. For me, that was like, I said, I can relate to that. I took integral calculus, and I could understand how there are some things that are difficult for us to comprehend and to fully understand. The second time around, I finally passed calculus with a B plus, but I never completely understood calculus. Part of my reason for that is I had a teacher who spoke German, he didn't speak English. I couldn't understand what in the world he was saying when he was writing on the board, and nothing seemed to help. So uh, anyway, that's, that's old history, <laughs> really old history. So who is Jesus? He is God. Second, believe on Jesus because he's the creator. The Bible says all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. He's the creator. Did y'all know that? He is the creator. So when it goes back to in the beginning was God, in the beginning God, he created the heavens and the earth. That's what the scripture says. In the beginning God, well if he is God, then he has to be the Creator. And if He's the Creator, I think it would be wise for me to want to know Him. And really wise for me to want to listen to Him and obey Him because He's God. Jesus has an eternal relationship to God the Father. And with the creation, the Word was present at creation and He was the agent of creation. Everything that exists was created by the Word. He is the Creator. Jesus is God the Word, and Jesus is also God the Creator. God reveals Himself in the creation. That's why it says the heavens are declaring the, the, the glory of God, right? Everything that exists declares the glory of God. What does glory mean? Glory means revelation. If you replace the word glory with revelation, it means you can see God in everything that exists. If you really are a spiritually minded person, you see God in all kinds of things around us. And when you begin to realize the existence of God is proven and very evident in everything that exists, you begin to be in awe about who God is. You begin to realize how great is our God. You begin to realize that our God is the most fantastic, amazing person in all of creation. Colossians 1.15 says, Ah! He said He created us in His image. Look what this says. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. This is a two-way mirror here. We get to see God in us when we're born again, and we get to see God in Him. The image of the invisible God, first born over all creation. For by Him, by Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven and on earth. Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things consist. That means 
he not only created it, he holds it together in order. And everything that is in order in the universe is held together by God. Now, if you just go out on a night when the smog doesn't inhibit you from seeing, and you get away from all the lights, and you get into a dark place, and you look at the vast expanse of the heavens, you begin to understand God spoke. All this came into existence, and it is still held in order today, as it was in the beginning when He created it by Him. It's not an accident. If you notice about the universe, it's not evolving. It's expanding in its dimension, but He holds it all together. Don't worry about it. Trust God. Don't worry about all that stuff. <laughs> People worry about so many things. Be concerned about, do you know Jesus and are you obeying Him? Third, believe on Jesus because He's the originator of life and light. The Bible says, in Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend or overcome it. John uses the word life 36 times in his gospel. One doctor told his patient, he said, I have some good news and some bad news. First, I'll give you the good news. He said, you have only 24 hours to live. And the guy says, that's the good news? What's the bad news? The doctor says, I should have told you yesterday. <laughs> well, life is kind of like that, isn't it? We tend to do everything we possibly can to hang on to this life. Bad news and all. We hang on to this life, we do all these things, we suffer and get through this life. And someday, if you're born again and you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, this physical life will end. And you're going to step into heaven. And the one who's going to lead you into heaven is the Lord Jesus Christ who gave his life for you. And you're going to enter into heaven and you're going to want to call your wife back. And you're going to want to say, if you hadn't have fed me oat bran for all those years, I could have been in heaven a long time ago. <laughs> and then I'm going to call my doctor and say, you know, if you hadn't given me all these pills, I could have been in heaven years ago. There's no light bills in heaven. There's no food bill in heaven. There's no darkness. There's no death. There's no dying. There's no pain. There's no more suffering. There's no more tears in heaven. Heaven ain't such a bad place to be. It's like awesome, amazing, and it lasts how long? Forever. Yeah, there you guys know that. I don't need to tell you anything. You know all this stuff. John 8, 12, Jesus spoke to them again. He said, I am the light of the world. By the way, there's the light in heaven is Jesus. We'll never have to change another light bulb in heaven. Amen? No more light bulbs in heaven. He's the light of heaven. And He delivers us from sin. He delivers us from darkness. He leads us into His light, which is the light of life. Oh, man. I'm beginning to just wonder, what does heaven really look like? What is it like to be in heaven? Some of us in this family, this church family, have left here and already gone to be in heaven. And we're sad because we miss them. Really. We're sad because we miss them. But they're having the greatest eternal day of their life. They're just having a wonderful time in heaven because there's no more bad news in heaven. Can you imagine what that's like? And no more bills. <laughs> He's already paid it all for us. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it. White as snow. Well, there's a contrast between light and dark. It's really a spiritual conflict between light and dark. I had a little boy that was asking me the other day about darkness, and he was talking to me about the power of darkness and how uh, darkness was going to do this and that and the other. And I said, just stop right there. I said, darkness has no power over a child of God. Darkness is the lack of the existence of light. If you put one light into a dark room, the room is no longer dark. Did you know, you want to know how long you can see a candle? If you're out in the fields at night and it's dark, 
and you light one candle, you can see one candle for 50 miles if you have, don't have cataracts and you have good vision. <laughs> but you can see one candle for 50 miles. After that, the only reason we can't see it, it's not because the dark put it out, it's because our eyes aren't good enough to detect light from too far away. You cannot put out the light. So what should we do? Tell people about Jesus. If he's God, and he is, if he's the source of life and light, and whoever believes in him receives eternal life, who in the world should we not tell about Jesus? Could you give me a list of the people we should not tell about the good news? I don't have anybody on that list. Are you using your Operation Andrew, your list of names of those that you're praying for? Brothers, sisters, family members, friends, co-workers, just anybody that you know that needs Jesus. You put them on your list, you begin praying for them. God will work through your prayers and answer your prayer and you'll come tonight we're going to talk more about how to have a quiet time and how to spend more time in the Word and how to learn. So let's tell people about Jesus. The Word of God has a number of things to say about it. In chapter, verse 6 it says, There was a man sent from God. His name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light. He's talking there about John the Baptist, not John the disciple. He's talking John the Baptist. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. And I translated that as, it's the same words, but I think I like this order better. That was the true light which, coming into the world, gives light to every man. I think that's what it really means. Jesus is the light. Anyway, it goes on in verse 10. He says, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. Now when it says in his name, the name of Jesus is Yeshua in the Hebrew, and the name literally means God is my salvation. So when it says to believe in his name, it doesn't mean just to believe in a name. It means to believe in the name, which re represents the fact that God is my salvation. I cannot save myself by my good works. He is Yeshua. God is my salvation. I cannot live myself in such an upright and godly way that God would say, oh, you're good enough to get into heaven because all have sinned and fallen short.